Hey Bethel, thank you for joining us online today. I'm Tim Mathies and I serve as the Director of Communication for Bethel Church. And I just wanna thank you for your generosity. Because of your commitment to the Make Room Initiative, we've reached 80% of our commitment goal. So thank you so much for jumping in and being part of this mission and vision for the future of Bethel Church. However, we need to reach 100% of our commitments in order to keep moving forward with this initiative. As you heard last week, our elder board gathered to talk about how we move forward and they decided to add a fourth year to our Make Room campaign. And we want to make sure that you understand all that went into this decision and be able to participate confidently. So we're going to have some informational meetings. We had one on Thursday. We have a video version of it coming out tomorrow in an email. We have two informational meetings today at Bethel Fergus Falls, one at 9.15 and another one at noon. There's another one that will happen at Bethel Fergus Falls at 9.15 next week. If you have any questions about this, please consider participating in one of these informational meetings or watch the video that will come out by email tomorrow. Bethel will be holding a business meeting next Sunday, the 28th at noon, to vote on a motion to adjust the campaign threshold to fit the adding of the fourth year. This threshold sets the timeline for the Fergus Falls project to expand the parking lot and build a new sanctuary. Also, I wanna remind you about the Lenten season. We'll be holding weekly worship services in Battle Lake and Fergus Falls. Please consider joining us uh, to gather to follow Jesus as he journeys to the cross. Now we're going to hear from Pastor Dave as he continues the sermon series, Backward, Living Life with the End in Mind. Well, greetings, Bethel, and welcome to those of you joining us today, whether you're online or at Bethel Battle Lake, uh, greetings and welcome to you. Uh, I want to begin the message today with, with a quote from a powerful leader who once said this, the greatest joy is to conquer one's enemies, to pursue them, to seize their property, to see their family in tears, to ride their horses, and to possess their daughters and wives. Quite a guy, huh? I'm gonna pop quiz, you know, who said this? Can you guess who said this? Multiple choice, here it is. A, Genghis Khan. B, King Nebuchadnezzar. C, Vladimir Lenin. Or D, Pharaoh of Egypt. Who is it, who is it, who is it? Take a guess, what do you think, what do you think? Answer, A. It was Genghis Khan who said this. But here's the thing, right? As you look at the list of these guys, every one of them could have said it. Like every one of them seems like, yeah, that, I could see him saying something like that. And so what this shows us is this, that the reign of rulers in world history is not exactly inspirational. You know, it's not exactly inspirational. So... So how do we relate to authorities and leadership, to government, to kings and kingdoms? How should we live our lives under the reign and rule of authorities down here while understanding that as believers in Jesus, ultimately, we are citizens of his kingdom and under his rule and reign? How do we do that? Thanks for asking. Why don't we turn to God's word for some help? Uh, I'm going to invite you to grab a Bible and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. We're going to look to deal with some of this. Solomon picks up some of that, uh, those themes there. And um, I'm going to read, uh, starting at verse 1. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Ecclesiastes chapter 8, starting at verse 1. Who is like the wise man? Who knows the explanation of things? Wisdom brightens a man's face and changes its hard appearance. Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since a king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? Verse 5. Whoever obeys his command will come to no harm, and the wise heart 
will know the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every matter, though a man's misery weighs heavily upon him. Since no man knows the future, who can tell him what is to come? No man has power over the wind to contain it, so no one has power over the day of his death. And as, uh, and as it says, as no one is discharged in time of war, so wickedness will not release those who practice it. Verse 9. All this I saw as I applied my mind to everything done under the sun. There's a time when a man lords it over others to his own hurt. Then too I saw the wicked buried, those who used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This too is meaningless. When the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. Although a wicked man commits a hundred crimes and still lives a long time, I know that it will go better with God-fearing men who are reverent before God. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. Righteous men who get what the wicked deserve. And wicked men who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. So I commend the enjoyment of life because nothing is better for a man under the sun than to eat and drink and to be glad. Then joy will accompany him in his work and all the days of the life God has given him under the sun. When I applied my mind to know wisdom and to observe man's labor on earth, his eyes not seeing sleep day or night, then I saw all that God has done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all his efforts to search it out, man cannot discover its meaning. Even if a wise man claims he knows, he cannot really comprehend it. This is God's word. Would you pray with me? Lord, uh, thank you for your word that speaks to us. Uh, as we open it now, we invite you uh, to open our lives and minds and hearts uh, to it. And that you would, Holy Spirit, take this word and bring from it uh, the fruit that you intend for us to bear. That we would be fruitful people in service of you in this world. To live lives of meaning in relationship with you. So... Uh, thank you, Lord, now. Uh, teach us um, through the teacher. Teach us through Solomon and help us to be your people today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Please, you may be seated. So uh, you probably remember uh, playing tug of war as a kid. Did you ever play that? You play tug of war as a kid? Tug of war. Uh, maybe somebody tied a, a red bandana in the middle of the rope, it's spread out, and, and in the middle is this red bandana. That was the center, right? And the goal was for those on the left and those on the right to pull as hard as they could to drag the bandana over the finish line for a victory. That's how you play the tug of war. Uh, politically speaking, some people feel like that red bandana in the middle. And every election season, a sort of predictable pattern emerges. Some people run to the rope and pull to the left. And some people run to the rope and pull to the right. And in the middle are those who, like that red bandana, are being pulled back and forth and, 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 and just really confused until, until they are drug over the line to cast their vote. Politics is divisive. It's the nature of politics. It calls you to take a side, left or right. And actually the word division literally means two visions. The word division literally means two visions. And so pulling on the left the view of human nature is that we are basically good and evolving as a people. 
The progressive view is that we are indeed progressing. And with that is a corresponding vision of creating institutions with centralized authority and power focused on releasing the goodness that's in all of us. On the other hand, you have those pulling to the right, and that is the view that, that, that human nature is, is basically crooked. We might say sinful. And, and with that comes a corresponding vision of creating institutional restraint. Because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? And so we call people to live lives marked by freedom and moral responsibility. And so that's kind of, that's, I know it's a simplistic and, and really overly simplistic, possibly even biased, you know, uh, caricature of these positions. So all of that being understood and accepted. Uh, some people find themselves, some people find themselves when they think it resonating with the pull to the left. And some people find themselves resonating with that pull to the right. And some people just feel like the bandana in the middle getting pulled and persuaded by both sides at different times and in different ways. And so we live down here in a system, in a political system with governments and authorities and powers and rulers. And the question might be for us, how should Christians engage with governmental systems and rulers that dominate the public life? How do we do that? Solomon tells us. Solomon, the world's wisest king, says the way we need to engage is with wisdom. That's how we engage. What might that look like? What might wise engagement involve? He tells us, verse, verse 2. He says, Obey the king's command, I say, because you took an oath before God. Do not be in a hurry to leave the king's presence. Do not stand up for a bad cause, for he will do whatever he pleases. Since a king's word is supreme, who can say to him, what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, here Solomon is basically giving the baseline for Christian conduct in civil society. And that baseline is this, obedience to those with authority. Obedience to those who are in charge, right? The, the default setting for the Christian should be to obey those who are in authority over them, okay? And the command to, to do that, I think, is given here with the assumption already built in, and here's the assumption, that you are at times going to feel like saying to those in authority as you disagree with them, what are you doing? What are you doing, leader? What are you doing? Have you ever felt like saying that? Have you ever said that to your leaders? Sure you have. Absolutely you have. Um, <laughs> this last year, every one of us has. Like this last year, every one of us has been the king's critic. Right? We absolutely have been. I'm not going to show, ask for a show of hands. Every one of us has been the king's critic. Whether, whether it was the president's handling, either one of them actually, of the pandemic uh, or governor's executive orders, every one of us was thinking to ourselves, I know better. I know better. Just ask me. Like, I know what you should do. I know. I know how to handle this. And every one of us is the king's critic because we all think we know better. I certainly thought I knew better. Just, just ask me. Haven't gotten a phone call from the, either president or from the governor as to what I think we ought to do. Have you? Right? But we all think we know better. I, uh, a few weeks back, I actually poked fun at younger people, of which I am not a part, right? I, I poked fun at, at younger people saying that every idealist, like under the age of, I don't know, like 25, 30, whatever, every idealist thinks that, that they know better. Like every young person thinks, Hey, if I were in charge, things would be so much better than they are, right? It kind of goes maybe with the territory. In fact, we should, we should want that in young people, you know? And, and yet, and yet uh, there's this idea, this outlook that, you know, God bless them. Most of them think if we were in charge, we would do better what the previous generations have done. We would fix the things they couldn't fix. We would make things better when they couldn't make anything better. Uh, Solomon, remember how Solomon in chapter 1 sort of pours cold water over that whole idea. When he says in Ecclesiastes 1, verse 9 and 10, he says, you know, I, I love it, guys, but listen, here's the reality. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already, long ago. 
What's Solomon saying? He's saying, listen, if you think that if you were in charge, everything would be better, here's the reality. Somebody else has already tried that idea. Somebody else has already come up with that idea. And, and if you were to do it, we would just, it would just be our time to go on your trip around the sun, you know, around the cul-de-sac. Round and round we go. Just kind of keep moving. Here we go. With no progress, we, this idea has come up before, and it's really humbling. And yet still, that doesn't keep us from taking up the cause, right? From picking up a cause and saying, we've got to do something. We need to fix something. We need to do something. Every one of us, we all need food, water, shelter, and a cause. What's your cause? Ecclesiastes chapter 8, Solomon says, um, please, do me the favor. Be critical of your cause. Be, be thinking about, think carefully about the cause that you want to take up. He says in verse 3, he says, do not stand up for a bad cause for the king, for he will do whatever he pleases, right? Uh, listen, some causes are just bad causes, right? There are good causes, and, and, and there, are, there are just bad causes to take up. So just remember that, you know? Uh, remember that. Be discerning. Next time the mob is forming, be, be slow to run to the shed and grab your pitchfork and, you know, let's go. Let's burn it down. Let's go do something, you know. And keep in mind Judas. Like, Judas was the one who was part of the mob. Can we all agree that Judas's cause was a bad cause? Be careful. There are some causes that are bad. Now, someone also says not only, is, not only are some causes bad, uh, but some are good, but, but they're just too early or they're too late. Like, the timing is off. Good cause, bad timing. Here's what he says. Verse 5. Whoever obeys this, uh, his command, that's the king's, will come, will come to no harm. And the wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. You know? And so he says, you might have a good cause, but you might have bad timing. So bad timing maybe, or bad cause. It might be actually a good timing and a good cause, but it might be the bad approach. That's the that's third thing he says. It might be a bad approach or bad procedure. Look at verse 5 and 6. He says, The wise heart will know the proper time and procedure. For there is a proper time and procedure for every matter. Okay. So summing this section up in the beginning of chapter 8, what Solomon is saying is, wisdom is to engage the environment in which you're in, the politics and the government and the king and the leadership and the rule and the reign. And obedience. Place yourself under that, you know, hupo tassel. Be submissive to, be submissive to the leaders. But if you're going to take up a cause, if you're going to advocate for something contrary to your leaders, then be sure that you're aiming for the right cause, done the right way at the right time for the right reason. Because otherwise you might just bring about change, but it might not be the change you were hoping for. In fact, it might even be worse than what you raged against. So you have to be wise. And think about what you're doing, because here's the reality. Let's be honest. It is easier to tear things down and to tear things up than to build things up and to create. It's easier to, be, to criticize than to create, right? Oh, man, it's easy to say, that's a horrible idea. That's a terrible thing. Why would you ever do Than to cut off your own. It's easier to tear something down than it is to create something. That's why, <laughs> that's why any knucklehead can do demolition on a construction site, right? That's why any knucklehead can grab a sledgehammer, you know, uh, you know, and just and knock things down and, you know, and tear things up. But it takes the skill of, of a Finnish carpenter to put something and build something in its place. So keep that in mind. What's the cause you're taking up? What are you doing? Be wise about that. Live in submission and obedience to those in authority. And when you oppose, be, be, be careful, be wise, and rethink the cause you're taking up. Still, Solomon acknowledges that uh, under the sun, which, which again is a word he uses, what, 20, 30 times in, in, the, in the book of Ecclesiastes, that life under the sun where people live down here with no reference to God, right? He, Solomon says there are some Sometimes what's true is that there are some things that no king, left-leaning or right-leaning, uh, can do anything to fix. Uh, there are some things that no political party 
can get there, can get, can get a solution for. You've noticed that. Like some things is perpetually are a problem. And Solomon says that sometimes no matter who's in office, uh, it seems like, and he says this in verses 7 through 14, sometimes it seems like no matter who's in office, wicked people get big funerals where people, are st- where people stand up and say nice things about them, but those things aren't true. Uh, Sometimes, no matter who's in office, evildoers get praised in houses of worship. Criminals get away with their crimes, which only encourages other criminals to commit more crimes. And often, the most evil people live the longest lives. And to make matters worse, sometimes good people are vilified when evil people, bad people, are vindicated. And sometimes what you do is you sort of throw up your hands and say, that's just just life down here under the sun. It doesn't doesn't work, no matter matter who's it. Who the king is, no matter what political party is in charge. Solomon says these sobering words in verse 17. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Even if the wise claim they know, they cannot really comprehend it. Solomon's just being honest. He's saying, you know what? Life is so messed up. It confounds all of us. It's confusing to all of us. The brightest of us, the smartest of us who are saying, I, I think I get it. They don't even get it. They don't. They don't understand. That's life under the sun. That's life without a reference to God. That's how it is, which is why, brothers and sisters, our hope is it not in any system under the sun. Our hope is not in any system down here. To live with the end in mind is to remember that our allegiance is to the king behind every king and, and to the kingdom behind every kingdom. This is our allegiance. The authority, listen, the authority of the king or the state is legitimate, but it is limited. And therefore, our allegiance to the state is legitimate, but also limited. What we long for and what we need lies above the sun. It's not down here. It's not down here. It's not where we live. It's not in this world. The reign of the ruler above the sun who commands our ultimate allegiance is what we long for. The one who came here placing himself under governing authorities that in the end condemned him and killed him. Our hope is in him. And even as he suffered, this is what he said. He said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. It's like, this is, it's like this is an echo at Calvary, the echo off of Calvary of what Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 8, verse 17. Despite all their efforts to search it out, no one can discover its meaning. Do you know the meaning of this suffering Jesus? And why he came and the difference that he makes. Here's what's, here's what's going on here today. Uh, even, as you, as you, even as you hear and listen to and watch this message. There's a, there's a tug of war going on. Right now. But it's not even one that you can see, but it might be one that you can feel. Can you feel the tug of war? It, it, it's a... It's, a, it's not, a, it's not a, a tug of war that happens kind of as a political contest, but it's more of a spiritual contest in our hearts, in our lives. The division, the division here is between two visions at war in every human soul, and maybe you feel it. There's the vision that you have of a self-directed life in which you add meaning to your life in your own way, and on your own terms. That, that's one vision for you. And there's a pull for that in our lives. Yeah, 
I get to add the meaning for my life. I get to be, I get to be the one to say the value that I have and the meaning that, that there is for my life and what I'm going to do with it. And then there's the vision that God has for you and the value that he has for you, that value that he says that you have. The vision that God has for you in which he makes your life full and meaningful both now and forevermore because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Whose sacrifice we commemorate today at his table. Jesus' death on the cross makes all the difference. Makes all the difference. And it's the vision, it's the vision that God offers to you today. The vision to see your life through the death of Jesus. Does this seem backward to you? To think of your life as finding meaning in the death of someone else? Well, then so begins your journey to understanding. And the pull of your heart across the line of faith which is the true victory. Give in to that pull today as the Lord works in your heart, creating faith in you and inviting you to embrace the vision he has of your life and for your life through Jesus, the crucified one. Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for your true and better vision of us true and better vision of of our lives and the value that it has and the meaning it can have in relationship with you. We receive that as a gift from you today. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Dispel uh, the the doubt uh, in us or the voices that, that cause us to listen to something less than this vision that you have for us and of us. We put our trust in you today, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your sacrifice at the cross, which we celebrate in this meal today. Thank you for your coming for us. Thank you for arising from the dead and and saying that one day, because Jesus rose, we too can live with you in life above the sun. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God's peace be with you. Bethel, thanks again for joining us online today. I want to encourage you to use the discussion questions provided by Pastor Dave at the end of this video to dig deeper into God's word and with those around you as we process what we just heard. You can also participate in worship by giving. You can give online or by mail. Your giving makes a huge difference here in Fergus Falls and Battle Lake and around the world. Just come along, jump in, and be part of what God is doing through Bethel Church. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.